Good morning, and welcome to worship this morning, whether you're here in person or watching on live stream uh, later on. Uh, we will be serving tea and coffee after worship in the Welcome Inn next door. Uh, following the positive outcome to the presentation on our building project at THQ on the 12th of June, our project steering group met last Wednesday evening to discuss the emerging details and next steps. Uh, we plan to issue an update on the building project in the 2nd of July edition of the pastoral letter, so keep your eyes peeled for that. Uh, next Sunday, our worship at 10 a.m. will be led by Major Pam. Uh, there is a fire drill coming in the next few weeks, just to make you aware. So if a fire alarm goes, it is hopefully a drill. And the assembly point is Carpenter Box down the road. So just be aware of that. Please can I uh, remind you, the flower list is at the back of the hall. Um, if anybody could put their name uh, next to a slot, that would be greatly appreciated. On Saturday the 29th of June at 7.30pm, our band will be presenting a festival at Uffington Park Methodist Church. Uh, no tickets are required, there will be a retiring collection after the festival. Sunday the 7th of July will be our YP anniversary, so our worship at 10am that morning will be led by our YP team and will feature our young people, so do come along and support that. And finally, uh, someone's had a special birthday this week, I'm sure you've probably already spotted it. Um, it's Pete's eighth birthday. <laughs> there were no eight zero balloons in the shop, apparently. So Karen said she's gone for his mental age. That wasn't me that said that, that was Karen. So shall we join in a happy birthday for Pete? Happy birthday to you. Happy I was going to say, it looks as though somebody's already given Pete the bumps, but had him up the wrong way when they did it, so <laughs> we hope that wasn't the case, Pete. Welcome. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning and to gather for worship. We're going to begin with a video that reminds us of how great the love of God is for his world. For God so loved the world, not just my world, the whole world. God loved every person in this world so much that he sent Jesus to teach us what that love looks like. Love is patient. Love is kind. Upendo hauna wivu. Upendo hauna kiburi. Ni orgulloso. No se comporta con rudeza. No es egoísta. No se enoja fácilmente. It always protects. Always trusts. Il espère. Il persevere. Love never fails. And since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Every nationality, every background, every history, every soul. Because in life, we find faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So as God has loved us, so we are called to love others. Our first song together this morning celebrates the love of Christ and joins in the rejoicing of heaven. It's number 163 in the Salvation Army songbook. I'm just going to get the words up screen if we can. Here we go. Would you stand and we'll sing the four verses straight through please Karen. <laughs> Thank you. 
those who just got the flags out, there'll be another song you can wave those to in a few minutes. But before we get to that, the songsters are going to come and share their message with us. And it's entitled, I Want to Know. question for the children first off and we'll get help from the grown-ups if we need to. Do any of you know what's happening on July the 4th? <laughs> okay, they've got some grown-ups being silly there. Yes, you too? What do you think? It's Independence Day. Where? Do you know where? In the USA, it's Independence Day, but there's something happening in this country on the 4th of July as well. Do you know what that might be? 
Alex? Voting, yes. It's the general election when the grown-ups get to choose who's going to represent them in Parliament. And the way that it works, unless you're doing it by post, in which case you do it before the day, you have to turn up at the polling station that you've been told to go to. They'll have had a card through the post to say where to go. And they get a bit of paper that's not much bigger than this. And if you're in this part of town, that piece of paper will have six names on it. If you live that side of town, you get eight names. Okay. Ooh, yes. More candidates standing in East Worthing than in West Worthing, or Worthing West, whichever it's called. And they get a pencil, but it's tied on a piece of string so they can't accidentally put it in their pocket. Okay, and they have to put an X by the name on the list that they want to choose who's going to represent them in Parliament. And whoever gets the most crosses in an area, they win, and they get to be in Parliament and to represent everybody who lives in their area. Heather's looking at me. I've got it right, haven't I? Yes. <laughs> I'm glad, glad I got that right. Now, do you ever get to vote at school? Do you ever do choosing of teams or a captain, maybe, at school? Yeah? Do you like doing that? Yeah? Do any of you ever get to be the team captain? No. No. Too shy. But do you like choosing the team that you're going to be on, do you? Or deciding who is going to be your captain? Now, we obey the laws that Parliament makes, we do our best to do that, and we pray for our political leaders. And if we're in a team, then we try to follow the leader of that team. But we also have another leader that we choose. Can you think who that might be? Who have we been singing about this morning? Jesus, absolutely. Now, we don't get to vote for Jesus. We don't put an X on a piece of paper to choose Jesus. But we do get to choose whether we follow him or not. A few people will know who our current, will know our current MP, not who he is, but actually know him personally. But do any of you know Rishi Sunak personally? Other than Heather, okay, <laughs> other than Heather, um, we don't, but we can all get to know Jesus, okay, and he chooses all of us to be his followers, and he wants us to keep following what he says we need to do. He wants to keep us, us to keep following him step by step each day. Now, the singing company are going to sing for us. It's not the song that we had planned um, because we've got a COVID family again this morning. So they're going to come and sing to us, Have I Told You About My Jesus? Which I think is a new song. Yes. Excellent. <laughs>
That was great. We look forward to hearing that song again. It's an opportunity for us all to sing now. It's in the Salvation Army songbook, number 819. An invitation to us as the church to arise and put our armour on, to hear the call of Christ, who is our captain. Would you like to stand? And those of you who've got flags, you might want to wave them during this song. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> to listen to a song that talks about our response to that call of Christ our captain, a, a response that says, send me. So we'll listen to that music. The children are going to go upstairs for their teaching, and we'll start on the left and work our way across, and there's a basket upstairs for those in the balcony. Thank you. If it's bandaging the broken or washing filthy feet, here I am, Lord, send me. If it's loving one another, even when we don't agree, here I am. If I'm poor, if I'm wealthy, I serve you. 
together. Dear Lord, we just ask you to bless the money we've given this morning. Bless its use in this place. Bless us as we've given and bless those who will receive benefit from us being in this place. And as we go from here, please help us just to love those that we meet. Amen. Thank you, Duncan. We're going to listen to the message from the band, and then Luke is going to come and share the Bible reading for this morning with us. Good morning. Yeah. Um, the band piece is a newly published one that came out last year, and uh, we played it when it first came out, but we're going to, um, it's one of my favourites because it's an old singing company song um, that I remember singing. Uh, with Barbara when she was our, so, uh, wife, our singing company leader. And uh, it's called A Simple Prayer, and the words say this, Hello God, this is your friend again, I'm sorry I can't stay. The bed's so soft and it's been quite a day, and so I'll simply say, I love you God. I really do remember all the good things that you've done, and all the good things that you've helped me do. But if I take the time to say thank you, God, for everyone, I would have to pray the whole night through. So this is a simple prayer, and listen out without adding on the pressure. It has a second cornet solo that Daniel's been very busy practicing. No. Thank you. 
The Bible reading this morning is taken from John chapter 20, verse 19 to 23, and I'll be reading from the NIV. Jesus appears to his disciples, it's entitled. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Amen. Thank you, Luke. That was a short and sweet Bible reading this morning. I'm just going to unpack that briefly. I'm not the main speaker this morning. The main speaker is going to be the general. Okay? Um, we're going to watch the general on video in a minute. But I just want to give a little bit of biblical background to what he's going to be saying. The verses that Luke has just read for us contain within them themes both of the Great Commission and of Pentecost with Jesus telling his disciples that he's sending them just as God has sent him and instructing them to receive the Holy Spirit. I think we've got some slides coming up for this. We can just get those. Okay, so we're thinking about being a missional people. And the first thing we learn in this reading then is that God is ascending God. We've got a slide for that, David. Lovely, we caught up. John 3.17 tells us that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. As we thought about a couple of weeks ago, God has sent Jesus into our world, not just to save human beings, but to save and redeem the whole of creation. And he sends Jesus out of love, as the previous verse in John's Gospel so famously states. This is the mission of God in a nutshell. It's not only, though, Jesus who is sent, but he, in turn, sends us to work with God in his mission. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you, says Jesus to his disciples after the resurrection. The theologian Christopher Wright says this. I'm going to put it up on the screen. Fundamentally, our mission, if it is biblically informed and validated, means our communal participation as God's people, at God's invitation and command, in God's own mission, within the history of God's world, for the redemption of God's creation. Our mission is is God's mission. God is written into that mission all the way through, like it's in a stick of rock. Each of us who claims to be a disciple of Jesus is sent to join in with God's mission of saving the whole world. But we're not sent empty-handed. For as that reading Luke shared also shows us, God is an empowering God. When Jesus sends his disciples out in mission, he provides the equipping and the power that they need. And he does that through his Holy Spirit, who reminds us of all that we have learned about Jesus, who grows spiritual fruit in us so that we take on the character of Jesus, and who gives us gifts that equip us for mission. It's interesting that Jesus gives his disciples this command as he breathes on them. It's the same idea that we find in the creation narrative in Genesis 2, verse 7, which says, Then the Lord formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. And it's the same again in Ezekiel's vision of the dry bones, where he recounts, So I prophesied as the sovereign Lord commanded me, and breath entered them, 
they came to life and stood on their feet, a vast army. In both of these Old Testament scenarios, it's the breath of God that brings life. And so in John 20, we see Jesus breathing life into his disciples, into his church, to empower us for the mission that he's sending us on. As we respond to that call, let's join in with the mission of God, with what God is already doing, so that we can be a love letter to the world. That's all I wanted to say. It's just to give some clarity when the general is going to be talking about having clarity about our mission. So before we listen to the general, we're going to sing again together. The band are going to help us, and it's number 603 in the Army Songbook. Lord, I would be available. A song of saying to God, yes, I'm ready. Here I am. Send me. Thank you, Karen. to the general. Let's welcome the general of the Salvation Army, General Lyndon Buckingham. Now, thank you very much, everyone. 
I have coined the phrase in reference to the strategic framework as this. People, mission, and legacy. What is the Salvation Army going to be about in this next chapter of our life? We're going to be about our people, we're going to be about our mission, and we're going to be about our legacy. Uh, you know, in my homeland of New Zealand, uh, the native Māori people have a beautiful proverb. He aha ti manui o te ao. He tangata, he tangata, he tangata. What's the most important thing in the world? It is people, it is people, it is people. And one of the things that was emerging from these conversations was actually a particular focus on our people. And by our people, I mean those people who already belong to us, who already consider the Salvation Army their home, either their spiritual home or their place of work or the place where they volunteer. But in some way, we are focusing now on people who have identified themselves in some way with the mission and the work of the Salvation Army, whether they be worshippers, adherents, friends, soldiers, staff, volunteers, or even officers. We want it to be that our people, whoever our people are, are clear about our mission, understand who we are and what we're trying to do on the planet, clear about our mission, inspired by our mission, and keen to play their part in its accomplishment. Not only keen to play their part, but appropriately equipped to play their part in a way that matters and makes a difference. The second word uh, that, that we have in this kind of three thing is mission. And we're talking here about mission impact and, and a desire for the movement to be as impactful on the planet as it can be. There's an understanding that we've come to slowly and reluctantly. We're realizing within the movement we can't do it all. We can't do everything. We have to learn to collaborate. We have to learn to share responsibility. We have to learn to partner. We've got so much to learn. We can't do everything. But what we can do is test ourselves to ensure that what we are doing is as impactful as it can be. And by impactful, I mean that it's actually work that is helping us to accomplish the mission. Because we can be busy doing all sorts of things that are completely unrelated to why it is that God raised us up in the first place. So when we're talking about mission impact, we're talking about a clear understanding and a clear focus of what it means to be the people of God on the planet and what it is that the king would have us do, first of all, as disciple followers of Jesus, and second of all, as people who have committed to the mission of the Salvation Army. So we have to be clear about our mission. To quote the draft document, the call to every Christian is to be actively involved in the mission of God. To that end, the Salvation Army plays a distinctive role in the church today. For those who associate with our ministries and or support our movement, a greater effort to enhance mission impact is required. I am concerned and remain concerned about what has been defined as mission drift. If we are not clear about who it is we have been raised up to be, we lay ourselves open for various interpretations and deviations that will take us away from our missional purpose on the planet. It often happens subtly and without our even being aware. We can move further and further away from what it is that God called us up to be and to do, mission drift. If the mission is proving challenging, the answer is not, in my opinion, to soften it, but rather to explore fresh, creative, and innovative ways to accomplish it. I have to say to you that our congregational life in many parts of the world is suffering. We just have to be truthful about it. We are struggling. We were struggling before the pandemic, and we're struggling even more as a result of the pandemic. And so I want us in this strategic framework 
to give permission to territories around the world to be intentional about exploring fresh expressions, integrated mission, core-based flourishing. What do we need to do to get our cause flourishing again? If we do not foster strong communities of faith within the Salvation Army, we will drift into the charity-only space. And the only way we're going to prevent that from happening is to be incredibly intentional about the holistic nature of the mission of this movement, the spiritual well-being of people, the proclamation of the gospel, the sharing of the good news that God has inaugurated a new kingdom to which anyone can belong and that Jesus is the king of that kingdom. And it is now and it will be. And the promise of the word is that it is an eternal kingdom. We need to be people about kingdom. The last part that you will read in the, uh, in the document, the strategic document, when you get it in your hands and the ones that you have before you, is this call for an enduring army. I've coined the phrase legacy, but you understand that what we're talking about here is sustainability. It's stewardship, it's accountability, and it relates to mission impact. What are we leaving behind? What are we entrusting to the next generation? Can we be proud of our footprint on the planet because of the way we're organized, because of the way we're financed, because of the way we're structured, because of the way we're accountable for the resources entrusted into our care? What are we handing on? to the next generation of leaders. This is the concern for us when we think about this aspect of legacy. I'm not talking about legacy in terms of what was done 100 years ago. I'm talking about us in the present day. We who are committed to the movement one way or another now. What is it that we are putting our hands to today that will give us a sense of humble pride as we pass it on to another generation of leaders? We have work to do. So I'm asking us in this framework to be brave as we explore such topics as membership, belonging, the place of covenant. I want us to double down on our efforts to inspire young people to put their faith in Christ and to be re-inspired about the mission of our movement in the world. I want us to pay attention to the reality of dying core in the West. And I want us to own it first and then invest ourselves in coming up with creative ways to turn it around, right? Be courageous. If it's dead, give it a burial. If it's sick, give it medicine. If it needs watering, water it. If it needs starting again, start it again. Clear about our mission, understanding who we are and what we're trying to be in the world, but willing to take some creative, innovative risks in order for it to happen. An army that loses sight of or forgets its mission is done. I don't want to be a part of it. So I'm asking you to get on board. Leadership teams around the world, look at your strategic plan. Make sure that what you're doing is in line with this framework. For the survival of the movement and its impact around the world depends upon us globally owning these challenges in the days ahead. And I'm excited about that. And there's going to be all sorts of forums and work streams and conversations and recommendations and plans that will emerge as a result of the strategic framework that will give huge opportunity for people to be creative and innovative and for us to once again flourish in that space of bringing people into the kingdom of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not going to kick the can down the road. This all needs a freshen up. It needs some courageous decisions to be made. And I am calling on the international leadership of the Salvation Army and everybody else that has an interest in the welfare of the movement in the hands of God going forward to embrace these conversations, to embrace this dialogue, to wrestle with this material and to believe together that actually the future of the movement can be celebrated every bit as much as the past. To ensure that, we have to engage now. And I'm calling on you to help me with that. May God bless you.
So you heard the general there refer to a strategic framework document which outlines his vision for what the army needs to focus on. And we've just had an overview of that. We understand that the document's going to be released to the world at the next General's Consultative Committee, which will be in September. And we're hoping that another video is going to come out to unpack that a bit more and give some more information. But as we respond now to what the General has said, let's pray together. God of majesty, your glory fills the earth and the heavens. You are the maker of all that is, of all that is good, of all that seeks good, of all beauty and truth and nobility. You surpass all that we think of you. You are found in places we don't expect to find you. You speak to us in ways that are so ordinary that we often fail to hear you. And you reveal yourself in things that are so wonderful that we often fail to grasp that you are behind them and in them. Lord, we pray that you will help us to see you and to hear you and join in with what you are doing this day. In silence now, O oh Lord, we ask that you speak to us and that you hear us and help us. We offer to you our prayers. We offer to you our hearts, our minds, and our souls, so that you may fill them with all that you want us to have. Lord, hear our prayer and in your love answer. Tender and caring, Lord, hear our prayers for those whose pains and sorrows and joys and thanksgivings are upon our hearts this day. We pause to lift them up before you by name in our hearts. Lord, hear our prayer and in your love, answer. Father of us all, we know you care for all that you have made and for all whom you have made. Hear now our prayers for our world and for the nations that fill it for those who hunger and thirst for the bread and water you give in abundance, for the justice and the mercy that you want everyone to experience, for the peace and the wholeness that you want everyone to know. Lord, hear our prayer and in your love answer. Sending God, we thank you for one another. We thank you for choosing us to follow you and join in your mission right where you have placed us. Help us to be faithful to you in the legacy that we are building for the next generation. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send your spirit in this place. Send us love. Send us power. Send us grace as you send us in your name. Amen. I invite you to sing again. It's song 679, sorry, 695 in the Salvation Army songbook. And we're just going to sing verses 1, 2, and 5. Okay? Alan's going to help us at the piano. Thank you, Alan.
Let's pray. Lord, we bring before you each person who has been particularly moved by the message from the general this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the way that you have spoken through him. Lord, we do pray for Major Sheila at this time when she's in a lot of pain. And we pray that you'll bring her relief from that pain and rest for her mind and her soul. Lord, be with us each. Help us as we work out that way forward with you, joining in with your mission here in our world. Amen. I was going to share with you a training opportunity that's coming up that will help with equipping for that mission. Um, but time is getting away, so we will look at that next Sunday. But I simply invite you to join me in a prayer of response now. We've got a slide that's coming up on the, on the screen. Lovely. So when you hear me say, here I am, I invite you to respond, send me. A child once dreamed the voice was calling his name, Samuel. Fishermen once heard the voice when a young man bid them follow, and still the voice beckons today. Can you hear? Here I am, send me. Moses protested vehemently as the voice spoke at the burning bush. Mary stood amazed as the voice proclaimed impending birth. And still the voice beckons today. Can you hear? Here I am. Send me. <coughs> Rosa Parks followed the voice to the front of the bus. Martin Luther King Jr. heard the voice as the bullet shattered. And still the voice beckons today. Can you hear? Here I am. Send me. The voice beckons from humble places, in the tears of hungry children, in the cries of the frail and frightened elderly, in the pleas of those whose dreams have been too long deferred. And still the voice beckons today. Can you hear? Here I am. Send me. A timid believer pauses to listen to the voice. A struggling church hears the voice and turns. And still the voice beckons today. Can you hear? Here I am. Send me. Amen. And so we affirm our decision to follow Jesus and to be sent by him in our closing song, 1002 in the Army Songbook. I, the Lord of sea and sky, we respond, here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord. If you lead me, I will hold your people in my heart. Let's stand as we sing these words of affirmation together.
send us into the world's turbulence as instruments of your peace and send us as agents of your justice that all might know the truth of your ways. Send us as artists who bear the joyful burden of your creativity that we might bring light into the darkness and hope among the despairing and grant us the joy of fellowship with your spirit and with one another this day and forever. Amen. <laughs>